Jim. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for um, inviting me here. Thank you, Geraldine and University of New Mexico. I'm thrilled to be here. As Jim mentioned, we all love coming to New Mexico. And um, I'm happy to share with you a project that we have been working on for about four years, which we call a 100-year vision for the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River region. And the reason we started this uh, has to, a lot to do with what I do at Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. I run the urban design and planning discipline for the firm, and we have studios in London, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Shanghai, and we're involved with governments, mostly doing large-scale urban planning. And the realization that we're not really watching out for our ecosystems, our ecosystems are somewhat fragmented by political boundaries, caused us to start thinking about the Great Lakes. So I'm going to start with a four-minute film that we use in a, in a way as an icebreaker to all sorts of audiences. We present this, we've been presenting this discussion uh, on the Canadian side of the border and U.S. side of the border now in many, many cities uh, and many different government agencies. And it's really to get the conversation going. It is a work in progress. It is a pro bono effort uh, by uh, uh, our firm. And uh, it's not meant to be a project that has a finite end, nor is it one that we want necessarily ownership on. Uh, Rick Richardson gave me a great quote today, which I want to use at the beginning of this, which was from Kevin Lynch, which uh, said we should aspire to lead from the side. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. We're not environmental scientists. We're not... Uh, experienced in politics, uh, we're architects and urban planners and landscape architects and we're interested in the health of a larger ecosystem. So I'll start with the film and then uh, I'll give you this uh, uh, presentation. So I just have to get out of this and then I'm going to go to this. Kena mampi, mampu ye yat. Nim dige, ekom damot mandem bish, mampi Chicago. You know, kena go eking. The kwede me work mandem ni. You must sing. You come dami manda bish nang. Obo ni nach toin mandem bish. Kena mampu ina mada da. You nang den dami manda bish. This water is life. Cette eau, c'est la vie. Inland seas carved by glaciers before the birth of humanity, sustaining our lives. Des mers intérieures creusées par des glaciers avant la naissance de l'humanité. Cette eau, c'est notre survie. Within the Great Lakes Basin is 20% of Earth's surface fresh water, seemingly an unlimited natural resource. Dans le bassin des Grands Lacs se trouve 20% de l'eau douce sur Terre. Première vue, une ressource naturelle inépuisable. Bountiful, beautiful, valuable, shared. Généreuse, magnifique, précieuse, commune. What do the Great Lakes need from us? As their people, what can we do together? Quel est notre rôle envers les Grands Lacs? Nous qui sommes leurs habitants, que peut-on faire ensemble? An dinat logo ki tarha, ham saath milkar kya kar sakte hain? Nahnu sukkan hadha al-aqlim, wa maadha bi-imkanina nahnu an-naman. First, the Great Lakes show us our region without borders. Premièrement, les Grands Lacs nous montrent notre région sans frontières. The Great Lakes encourage us to dissolve the man-made borders between states, between nations. Ces derniers nous encouragent à défaire les barrières humaines entre les États, entre les nations. Second, the Great Lakes invite us to take responsibility forever in how we do business, plan, govern, consume, and conserve. Deuxièmement, 
Les Grands Lacs nous invitent à nous responsabiliser pour toujours dans notre façon de faire les affaires, de planifier, de gouverner, de consommer et de protéger. Third, the Great Lakes invite us to realize the full potential of their gift. Troisièmement, les Grands Lacs nous invitent à réaliser le plein potentiel de leur don. The Great Lakes encourage a shared way of life. Les Grands Lacs encouragent un mode de vie commun. Pour un deal de manière libre. Yong yo yiko gong xiang de shenghuo fang shi. Sustained by our abundant geography and enhanced by cooperation. Our cities and universities allied along high speed connections. Possible grâce à une géographie abondante, enrichie par notre coopération, nos villes et universités interreliées par des voies à grande vitesse. And finally, The Great Lakes invite us to see that we live in a vast international park. Finalement, les Grands Lacs nous invitent à voir que l'on vit dans un vaste parc international and to behave accordingly with stewardship and the joy of living et à agir convenablement avec engagement et joie de vivre. The Great Lakes encourage us to work in harmony, pursuing a shared vision. Les Grands Lacs nous encouragent à travailler en harmonie, poursuivant une vision partagée. The Great Lakes century has begun. The region will renew and restore and prepare for the return of dynamic growth to the lands surrounding these precious waters. Le siècle des Grands Lacs a commencé. La région va se renouveler et se restaurer. Préparons-nous au retour d'une croissance dynamique dans les territoires bordant ces eaux précieuses. Our Great Lakes. Nos Grands Lacs. Nuestros grandes lagos. Nuestra vieja y So we began this in 2009 because it was a 100-year <coughs> centennial anniversary of the Daniel Burnham plan for Chicago. And uh, this group in Chicago was organizing different firms and organizations to do something for this centennial. And they asked us to get involved. And I think I said something profound like no. And, and then we started thinking about it. And uh, we went back to the, the plan. And the, to me, the thing that struck me the most was this drawing. It was a little drawing in the book, but it showed Chicago in context with the full Great Lake. And we thought, well, if we take another 100 years out with this great threat to our environment, what, is a, what good is a healthy city if it's on a polluted or dead Great Lake? So he said, well, what's the vision for all of the Great Lakes? Is there a vision? Is, what's out there that protects the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes watershed? So he said, if we started 2010 to 2110, let's take the next 100 years and say, what's the plan for this Great Lakes and St. Lawrence region? Because the two work together, the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence. But it would be a holistic strategy for cities, for water, for energy, environment, agriculture, industries, everything, uh, especially governance. So we've started to put this story together, and this is a sort of portable exhibit that goes around uh, that helps to tell this story. And this is what I'm going to share with you tonight. And why I always show this little baby uh, as part of the Great Lakes Century is we're really doing it for this generation and for the next generation. How can we ensure clean water, 20% of the world's fresh surface water, how can we ensure this to be clean for these next generations? And I also think water is a unifier. This baby's body is 75% water. Our bodies are 65% water, plus or minus. Our brains are like 90% water. So how can we not be thinking about water. I think water is a tremendous unifier for us. And when you look across this uh, Great Lake region, you realize what a big lift it is. This is a massive region 
And what is the governance in place to watch over the health of these Great Lakes? This uh, Great Lakes system is big enough to create its own weather. These, this is a satellite photograph of what we call lake effect snow. Is there anybody here from the Midwest or the Great Lakes region? A few. Anybody from Canada? Okay, but at least people from the Midwest. Uh, you know what I'm talking about with lake effect snow. It's always good to live on the upwind side of the Great Lakes because the downwind side is, gets a tremendous amount of snow. The lakes are also the foreground of some of our great American cities, uh, like Chicago here. It's the destination for thousands of people uh, in the summer months for recreation, and it's also a beautiful collection of freshwater lakes, uh, even if you're the only one out on the shore. The watersheds of North America are pretty clear and easy to understand, uh, created by these large um, mountain ranges, so the Rocky Mountains create a very clear watershed moving to the west. The Mississippi and Missouri and Ohio rivers create this great watershed, magnificent watershed in the heart of the country. The Appalachians create the other watershed. The Great Lakes are somewhat of a shallow bowl. It's maybe the least understood watershed. It, they don't drain at all into our major river systems, but they connect to the St. Lawrence and to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Atlantic Ocean. And then most of Canada is draining north towards the large bay you see here. When we look at the political boundaries, I think this is the biggest political boundary, international boundary in the world between the US and Canada, two very friendly nations. But when you look at how it went through the Great Lakes, it divides uh, four of the five Great Lakes in half, basically. Only Lake Michigan is 100% in the United States. The other lakes are half and half, which is part of the reason why I think we haven't had a holistic vision because no one's really sure who quite owns these. They're also of a scale that makes you sort of stand back and think you don't quite own these lakes. We, we overlay just the lakes, not the watershed, but the lakes over Europe to give you a sense of how big they are. And this little lake is part of this also Lake Nipigon, north of Lake Superior. If we put that on London, Marseille uh, is about where Chicago is at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And then Vienna is kind of close to Montreal and Warsaw is kind of close to Quebec. And then if we had drawn the whole Gulf, it would have moved us into Russia. It gives you a sense of the scale of this and its watershed is maybe similar to a European Union scale. And the coastline is very intricate, how the water meets the land. And when you unbundle that, you find out there, there are 11,000 miles of coastline, which takes you from Chicago to Perth, Australia. So this remarkable relationship between land and water. And then when you overlay political boundaries on this, which is a slide Jim had up before, you find that there are eight states in the United States, two major provinces in Canada, thousands of, of cities and towns, many counties, uh, First Nation reserves, uh, American Indian reservations. So you wonder how can you create a vision for something that is so divided up by political boundaries. But you also realize, looking at a map like this, that nobody is in control. Who's in control of the watershed when you have divisions like this? Who is responsible for the quality of that water? Now, recently, there's been the Great Lakes Compact, where all of the states and the two provinces have agreed to have 100% agreement to any diversion of water outside the watershed, either to a, a sprawling city that's moving outside the watershed, but to avoid, really, the issue of another state or another province buying significant amount of water in this watershed. One of my heroes is Buckminster Fuller, and his great quote, which is so simple, is, we're all connected. And that's applied really well to this project. 
when we first started, so many people said we have nothing in common with Buffalo. No one in Chicago could, has anything in common with Buffalo. Chicago and Toronto, forget it. Cleveland and Duluth, come on, are you crazy? And yet, the water does connect us all. The other great quote from Ian McCarg in the middle of the 20th century was that the greatest challenge of the 21st century will be the condition of the global environment. And I think this challenge of climate change, weird weather, global warming is really bringing all of us and all of our professions together around more creative interaction for solutions. So let me just <laughs> summarize quickly some of the issues we're facing. This uncertainty of climate change is influencing oceans by rising water, and you can see this with things like Hurricane Sandy. But on the Great Lakes, what it's doing is it's warming the lakes. Warming the lakes means there's less ice cap, there's more sun infiltration into the water, the lakes are warming, which maybe means that the lakes will probably be evaporating more water and the water level will be going down, not up. So as sea levels are going up, water levels may be going down. And only about 1% of the water in the Great Lakes is renewable by rain. 99% of that water has been left there by glaciers. This is a map of just where the water is warming. So you see the shallow areas like Lake Erie, the southern part of Lake Michigan are, are warming. The weird weather uh, is definitely impacting the Midwest, uh, the amount of tornadoes we're receiving, the intensity of storms. The way we generate our power is a tremendous issue. The United States, the coastal areas are blessed with other sources of energy in the Midwest, we basically have coal. And so you can see with this big box around uh, the United States part of the Great Lakes, this, this area, purple, red, whatever color these are, are right up at the top of carbon emissions because this is mostly power generated by coal-fired power plants. This is also the kind of data we normally found is maps like this that show Instead of Canada and the Great Lakes, it shows this kind of white space that looks like you, somebody took a bite out of the United States. It doesn't even show the other side of the lakes. And then usually this happens where they put Alaska where Mexico is. So no wonder you don't understand the Great Lakes. I mean, you don't understand, you look at these maps about the United States, there's nothing that communicates this amazing gift we have along this border. Water quality, across the United States has significant issues with contamination. The way our cities are engineered with uh, sanitary sewer overflows and urban runoff combined systems, stormwater and sanitary, sanitary waste uh, combined together in times of storms, that raw sewage goes into the lakes. Our cities are dumping millions of gallons of raw sewage into the Great Lakes. And then our cities also have especially these Midwest cities, have very impervious surface. So in Chicago, you have a very high level of paved surfaces. The city, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is someone telling me to move faster. Uh, the city has been building this deep tunnel project for years to hold stormwater so that basements aren't flooded. And then the whole city has been engineered to to take the Great Lakes water from Lake Michigan, use it, and then that plus stormwater goes into the canal system that goes to the Mississippi River. So every day, every single day, Chicago takes two billion gallons of water out of Lake Michigan, uses it, and puts it into the Mississippi River to head to the dead zone at the Gulf of Mexico. Agricultural runoff, also a great threat to the health of the Great Lakes. This satellite photograph around Detroit, this is Detroit right here, uh, Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, all the light color is the uh, runoff impacts following storm events, mostly from agricultural uh, areas. So how we farm our land, how we grow our food, how we build our cities, all of this starts to point to uh, the degradation of the system. 
invasive species comes in, have been coming in in the hulls of ships, but also now uh, coming up the Mississippi River is the Asian carp, uh, which has created a lot of press recently. Environmentally degraded areas of our past uh, manufacturing heritage and the way our cities are growing now at incredibly low densities, sprawling but requiring water to come way outside the watersheds. Whoop. And then the opposite of that, in uh, many of the Midwest cities, the population reducing. This is a photograph of Detroit where you have phenomenal amount of vacancy uh, in the city, but not in, in any one particular area. You have vacant land scattered evenly through large pieces of the city. Uh, related to the borders, there's some interesting geographic issues where there are only a few places to cross. So you have these pinch points between Canada and the United States. This is on the Detroit River between Detroit and Windsor. And you have these uh, almost breakdowns where freight and passenger traffic really uh, reach high capacity uh, and congestion at these bottlenecks. One of the reasons Chicago is such a hub, as you can see, to get around the Great Lakes. Chicago is the, the first place to the north where you can really pass the Great Lakes. Any place north of that, you hit an awful lot of obstacles. So the border is an interesting dynamic also. And this quote I thought was great, that as Europeans fought each other in World War II, uh, now the borders are fluid. The Canadians in the U.S., we've been friends for forever, or at least for 150 years or so. And our borders are, are strengthening because of the 9-11 instances. So how can we start to diminish those borders? So with those kind of issues in place, we started asking some other questions of how can we live life to the fullest without damaging the planet that we have? I think every design school is asking this question. Uh, we can, we believe, have a sustainable economy that's more profitable than an ordinary economy. We can design and build sustainable cities that are better than ordinary cities. We can celebrate a sustainable life that's better than an ordinary life. And I believe we're close, we're very close. Jim talked about how much advancement we've made in just the last two years. If you look over the last 10 years, our whole discussion involvement with sustainability and the challenges of, of being in balance with nature has advanced tremendously. I think in the early parts of this century, we're going to make great advancements. So we created a few buckets. I'm gonna show you eight of these buckets that we organized ideas around. The first was just to how to get our cities and our urban regions more in balance with nature. So how do we green our cities and keep the lakes healthy? Uh, how do we rethink our city's urban infrastructure to make it not just more resilient, but, but capable of filtering water, capable of generating cleaner energy without the pollutants? The Great Lakes is blessed with a legacy of remarkable cities, sources of great invention and innovation. The beginning of the steel industry, the understanding of, of uh, great shipping, manufacturing. These are cities that were really designed to build things. Many of these cities have kind of lost that uh, manufacturing strength to uh, other global cities. If we're going to be a global economy again, uh, I think we have to start working collectively. These diagrams were done by Richard Rogers maybe 20 years ago about how cities of today take in food, energy, and goods as inputs. They use them and then the outputs are waste, whether it's organic waste, emissions in the air, or in, inorganic waste in landfills. So it's kind of this one-way stream. And he was proposing quite a long time ago that you start to inject instead renewable energy recycle the organic waste, recycle the inorganic waste, and your outputs are much less. And that still basically applies today, and we're getting much smarter about what 
energy systems are renewable and what we can do with our waste to minimize it. Many cities in the Great Lakes have action plans and one of our efforts has been to understand these and to connect the dots between these different cities because many of them are using similar principles. The second idea was how do we define the entire watershed as an international park, the Great Lakes International Park, something that you live in, you work in, it's home to 50 million people, but we see this whole watershed a bit differently, that we have to be smart in this watershed, live in it in a way that does no damage to the lakes. The uh, National Parks, U.S. National Parks Second Century Commission Report has this idea that the next generation will be a new kind of international park, including lived-in landscapes and cityscapes, ecological restoration areas and corridors of conservation, not just beautiful landscapes that have a fence around them for preservation. We have a lot of public open space already in the Great Lakes between the, this large sweep of crown lands in Canada, federal lands, state parks, municipal parks. We can leverage tourism, which is a phenomenal industry globally, uh, if we could figure out how to sort of leverage the strength of the Great Lakes, get people on the lakes. There's a wonderful example between Canada and the United States with the Waterton Glacier International Park, which is over a million acres. It's a World Heritage Site between US and Canada. And it was established in 1932 as one park between two countries. And it was created by the efforts of the Alberta and Montana Rotary Clubs. Okay, I love that statement. If these Rotary Clubs can do this, I mean, think about it. If the Rotary Clubs can do this, we can do this. We can do this at a much bigger scale, apply this strategy or this energy to the full Great Lakes. There's even a national trail system. Who knew? Did you know? I didn't know. There's a national trail system all the way across the United States. There's another trail system in Canada. These could also be sort of linked into a whole discovery t tied to tourism related to the Great Lakes. The third idea was how do we engage the universities and research institutes at universities? There are many, many institutes focused on fresh water and the Great Lakes. How do we get young, bright minds together around this problem? There, there as I just said, many higher educational institutions that are, that are phenomenal leaders. How do we link them all together rather than have them be silos with separated institutions. So these are academic institutions of some of them. There are 21 that we identified related to uh, renewable energy, water research, uh, or Great Lakes research. How do we take this knowledge and link it together to help sort of push this whole idea forward and engage the next generation in this discussion? Where we're seeing this happen, and I'm going to get back to this a little bit in a minute, is related to urban farming and uh, this food revolution that's really engaging uh, young students, grade school students, in the whole idea of nutrition, how you grow food, uh, how you access healthier food. The fourth idea is about water itself. This is where I think, personally, most of the research has been done to date. Uh, how you ensure that water is clean and drinkable, that it's healthy, that it's swimmable, that it supports fish ecologies, uh, and that we return water to the lakes clean. Cities are looking at how to grow water. This is from Urban Labs in Chicago, a design studio that's looked at how Chicago can grow water by simply designing its street system, which is 40% of the land area of Chicago is in public streets. So how can you redesign the street system to absorb stormwater, filter it, put it back into the aquifer, or eventually back to Lake Michigan? BRK Ingalls, we've actually presented this many times to BRK and his project of sewer to bath in Copenhagen, where they've 
been working with Copenhagen's efforts to clean the harbor to the point where now people are swimming in it is a great example of what we could be doing with things like the Chicago River, which you would be out of your mind to swim in today. <laughs> and it's not just for us, right? I mean, this water system has to be clean for every living thing. Also with the the evolution of a lot of these industrial Midwest Great Lakes cities going from manufacturing to service industries, we have the ability to take down some of the tough engineered walls on, this, on these waterways, that which were all designed for barge traffic. We can take these down and start to soften these, these water edges. The fifth idea relates to how we create cleaner energy. Now it seems like everybody has access to clean, cleaner natural gas through fracking, which is also challenging water tables and water quality. But we pasted together uh, Canada and Quebec's, which if you're not Canadian, what we found out is Quebec isn't really Canada. Did, did you, Quebec is Quebec. Uh, and they have data stored a little bit differently than Canada. And we pasted all these things together. And we found that wind over the Great Lakes is very high, actually higher than almost all the wind within the uh, uh, west, western part of the United States. And, is this, and how is this a resource for us? I don't know if we put windmills in the water like Denmark has done, or whether there's new technology that doesn't put moving blades in the water. But how do we at least recognize we've got this resource of outstanding wind and how do we access it and how do we use it as a way to get our cities greener and less reliant on coal? We've been working with Ramble out of uh, Copenhagen who's been doing this uh, zero carbon city effort for Copenhagen since the 1980s and they gave us these charts which were quite dramatic that they have been using renewable energy and waste to energy strategies to lower their carbon emissions. So this blue bar just shows you where, where we are today versus where they were in 1980 and they've reduced carbon output by almost uh, two thirds. They have, uh, they say only 4% of their waste goes into landfill, 4% for the city of Copenhagen. Chicago puts about 90% of their waste in landfill and we don't recycle our sludge. Our sludge is somehow mixed in, into golf courses or something. But we can actually use waste and turn it into energy and we can certainly uh, start to shift away from carbon producing energy. The sixth idea is how do we link these various uh, Great Lakes economies together? We have airports. Many of these cities have international airports. We have an antiquated rail system for passengers. And many of these cities aren't hooked up to the Amtrak system. And then we have highways. Can we start to think of greener ways to get around? This is a new bikeway in Detroit. Uh, can we get cities more walkable, more compact, emphasize pedestrian environments more, safer bikeways? These are new bikeways that they're just starting in Chicago with puts the bikeway next to the curb and the parking out in the street. Light rail lines that get you from district to district in a city and then between city to city, is it at all possible that the US and Canada could work together on a high speed rail system that would link cities together? And why is that important? Well, if you compare the eastern part of the United States to China, this China on the uh, left, is well on its way to building this high-speed rail system. And much of this is, in, in, um, is operating today. Uh, the scale of Beijing to Shanghai is not much different than really Chicago to maybe Miami. Uh, the distance from Chicago to Washington, D.C., New York, Toronto, not that far. So if you compare these scales, uh, Chicago to Toronto is about a three, three and a half hour train ride if we were really using high speed rail. And isn't that much different from Paris to Marseille, uh, which is, or, or Tokyo, Osaka. These are high speed rail lines that have been running for a very long time. If we connected just Milwaukee to Toronto, 
I must have used this slide in a Milwaukee presentation. Normally we say Chicago to Toronto, so we adjust these things depending on our audience. But okay, Milwaukee to Toronto, 28 million people linked together. And look, look what's halfway between Chicago and Toronto is Detroit, a city that is, and a region that is really suffering. So economically, wouldn't this benefit from, wouldn't this economy of these cities benefit from linking the leading Great Lakes economies of Toronto and Chicago together? And then that eventually starts to link into a much more uh, fine-grained rail system. In addition to that, there is this whole new uh, invention of sort of larger container ships and the need for larger ports. It basically puts the entire St. Lawrence out of date in terms of accepting larger container ships. Canada is looking at major container ports in Halifax and over in Prince Rupert with rail lines that would connect those together, literally bypassing all of the United States in terms of, especially New York and Newark, in terms of moving goods across the, uh, North America. Getting uh, this region to be leaders in new economies, especially water industries, looking at water as an industry, the way you'd look at energy as an industry, that this would be a basin for North America's technology, seems to make a tremendous amount of sense. This should be the freshwater laboratory for the world. Water is not evenly distributed around the world. Many countries have significant freshwater issues, especially the Middle East. China has, I think, over half of its aquifer polluted. Every country is facing water issues. The whole idea of water technology, how we design our urban environments to support a cleaner water system, how we innovate in terms of water technology, is critical to the health of the world. Ensuring clean drinking water, ensuring that we can manufacture in water intensive uh, ways, but return that water clean, uh, produce smarter technology here, not just invent it here and have it produced in China, but find ways to invent it here and produce it here. The last subject is really about food, which is one of the most interesting because the Midwest is rich in fertile soils, but spends most of its energy uh, producing protein crops for um, uh, cattle or, or uh, meat. Uh, there is a organic farming movement going on. There's a local food movement going on. About 21% of all land in the Great Lakes watershed is in agriculture. And today, agriculture is as much or even more a culprit of pollution in the Great Lakes as, as is our cities. So how do we rethink our agricultural system? And maybe you guys are very involved in this here in New Mexico. And we certainly saw evidence of this at Los Poblanos today, a wonderful example of locally grown food. The average tomato uh, in the United States travels about 1,500 miles, 2,000 miles, from farm field to dinner table. So a tomato has a big carbon footprint. How do we get these cities, especially cities in the Midwest that are struggling, to uh, support locally grown food and celebrate that? This is Eastern Market in Detroit, which is one of the more vibrant parts of the city now with their farmers markets. Uh, this city has over 1,000 individual and community farms, 100,000 vacant parcels of land, and it's very inexpensive land. So how can we start to see this as a movement to come back in to your city, to reinvest in a city that has been largely abandoned? And how does this have the great ripple effects of getting the younger generation focused on food? Rick Bayless is a chef that we like to rally behind in Chicago. And he gave this great city uh, lecture on how cities of the future will be farms we happen to live in. And he grows a tremendous amount of produce in backyards and rooftops. And it's all about, in his mind, the science of compost. But how urban areas become producers of food is, seems like it's part of our future. So this 100-year vision that we've been proposing is maybe 
too holistic, but we're calling for more vibrant 21st century economies, protected waters, restored natural habitats, continuing to emphasize cultural diversity, anticipate climate change, reinvent our urban infrastructure, and focus really on a relationship of healthy cities and healthy lakes. We have this Great Lakes Century blog that you're welcome to join and participate in. Uh, and we've been working with what this very interesting group called the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. And these are mayors of Great Lakes cities. So all these cities' mayors are part of this group. There are 95 mayors. We presented to them many times. They've actually endorsed this whole study with a formal resolution. And we've been working with Mayor Daly in Chicago, now Mayor Emanuel, and uh, uh, Mayor Hartwell in Grand Rapids, uh, and others about how their cities can start to participate in a greener future for the Great Lakes. We continue to study this. As I mentioned, it's pro bono. We work at nights, weekends, and some guys just find the time. There are about four of us on this effort. The ongoing stuff has to do right now, the ongoing research with, with uh, uh, US cities. So these maps show the metropolitan regions of American cities under decline. So the red cities are in decline. You see New Orleans, and then you see cluster of cities, regions in Ohio and Michigan. At the city level, you see much more decline within the actual city limits, only in this sort of corridor, mostly in the Great Lakes region. The west, Albuquerque, somewhere here, I guess. Uh, east, cities are still experiencing growth. In the suburbs, very little decline. In many of the Midwest cities, the core areas are declining. The suburbs are growing at very low density, but some suburbs are actually declining as well. We started mapping city and uh, county uh, zoning to understand how much land is zoned for single family, low density housing on the United States side of the border. So all of these cities uh, are at risk to developing as much uh, as 4,000 square miles of what is now open land into low density residential development. So the Great Lakes Basin is expected to grow by about 16 million people. So if the suburban growth is about 2.6 people per household, we're looking at 3,800 square miles to be developed just in what's currently zoned. That's not, that's not recognizing that some cities or regions expand their residential areas. So how big is that? Well, it's, it's sort of hard to get your arms around 4,000 square miles, but if you added the state of Delaware and Rhode Island, that's not really that helpful. But anyway, it shows you that two states combined is what we lose. Why is that not good? It's, it's not good for lots of reasons. It takes that water, that land out of sort of healthy watershed. Uh, it suburbanizes at a very low density. It's probably all car related in terms of uh, uh, how uh, accessibility is handled. But the opportunities are also pretty phenomenal that most of these same cities used to be much bigger populations. Detroit, for example, in 1955 was almost 2 million people. Today it's 650,000 people. The region grew, but the city declined. And we're seeing a tipping point where, for example, Chicago, I know these are kind of hard to read, but in Chicago, the little blue pie was sort of 1990 to 2005. That was the amount of population growth in the city and, uh, versus the region. And now the latest uh, pie, which is uh, 2006 on, Chicago is getting almost half of the regional growth. People are coming back into cities. So is this a tipping point? Are we starting to see uh, reinvestment in cities and maybe uh, a, a halt or a slowdown of suburban sprawl. CEOs for Cities is an interesting organization that's done a lot of research on trends. 
And they said since 2000, the number of college educated 25 to 34 year olds has incre increased twice as fast in the close in neighborhoods of the largest US cities. So young professionals, young educated professionals are interested in living in urban environments. So Chicago, if we increase the density, to, let's just say 24 units per acre, can accommodate all the future growth that's anticipated in the Chicago re region in its vacant urban lands. So I wanted to show you an example of what we're working on in Chicago that is building at about that density, which is the old US uh, steel plant. I'll go through this quickly. This is on Lake Michigan. On the south side of Chicago, it was a major steel plant that employed 30,000 people. Uh, it closed, uh, but before it closed, this is how they made the land. The slag from steel uh, was basically dumped by these rail cars into the lake and it formed 40 foot high platform out into Lake Michigan, uh, which is now the area we are redeveloping. It looks like this today, all the buildings have been imploded except for some ore walls. It's uh, almost 700 acres of vacant land on the south side of Chicago. You can see downtown Chicago right here. We've been developing a plan uh, with uh, US Steel and uh, local Chicago developers and the park district to recapture the lakefront as public open space, extend the grid of the south side of the city all the way to the lakefront and create high, much higher density development at the lakefront uh, that is a, will translate to about 15,000 resident, uh, residential dwellings, plus uh, manufacturing space, academic space, and research space. Taking old uh, ore slips and turning them into new uh, centers of gravity for mixed use neighborhoods. Taking the ore walls and integrating them into a public park system which uh, the park district has now taken ownership of the ore walls. Uh, and we've engineered the city or this neighborhood to uh, actually now we're up to 100% of the stormwater can be filtered through the park systems and returned to the lake so that we're not taxing any of the existing stormwater systems and none of the stormwater is headed to the Gulf of Mexico. So this is the biggest chunk of Chicago that's returning to its, its native watershed. And that's all being done by how we design the streets, the walkways, and the park systems. And again, as I mentioned before, it's bringing the South Side neighborhood all the way to the, the lakefront and continuing Chicago's tradition of a public lakefront system. And just north is the water intake for potable water. And Toronto has now this district cooling strategy where they take the potable water and they transfer the cold water into district cooling strategies, which we can do here as well. So this entire district can be cooled by the potable water coming into the city from the Great Lakes so that you would not need air conditioning in each individual unit. Now, just stepping out regionally, all of these cities, all of these county areas have green network strategies, which we're also trying to piece together. So this is Buffalo's, for example, Chicago, Milwaukee, <coughs> Cleveland, Montreal, are all looking at defining the larger watersheds in their region and how to protect those. This is Chicago's. So just in closing, <laughs> uh, what we're really trying to encourage is how to reinvest in our existing cities, not walk away from them, how to reinvent urban infrastructure so that it's obviously more in balance with nature, how to direct the future to cities as opposed to, to, to developing rural areas, how to respect the larger ecosystems, and how to fund regional visions. Uh, somebody told us we had to have a plan uh, because we were talking or we're coming from a design firm. We didn't really have a plan. We still don't have a plan, but what this says is, let's take all the public, public lands today, put those together. Let's add to that the forests and the agriculture, and that makes this larger international park. 
then we put back on that the 50 million people that live in this region. We then add all the universities that are participating in this research and we cluster these in some ways around these creative districts that stretch from Duluth and Minneapolis all the way to Quebec. We link those in some logical, let's say high-speed rail system, put back in the international airports. We then uh, put suns in each one of these to indicate that they are shifting to more renewable energy and we put blue arrows on these to say that now they're working in more, a much smarter water systems. And that starts to give us a kind of roadmap that is supporting this larger watershed between two countries. I just wanted to share this with you. I found this about urban form, transportation, and energy consumption. I'd never seen this map before, that the higher cities that are uh, requiring much more energy are, of course, the American cities from Houston at the top to New York at the best. But then there's a group of Australian cities here the more efficient cities are the European cities, and then way down here are Singapore, and then way over here is Hong Kong because of its intense compactness and density. Moscow, we have to find out why that's there. It's very interesting and how these are measured. But city form, how you get around, and how much energy you consume all ties into this as well. So our future, I think there's a great urgency in the design communities to start thinking this way, to start getting out there in this conversation. Most of the conferences we go to are funded by environmental groups. There's never a designer in the room, never. I never see another architect. I don't see an urban planner. I don't see a landscape architect. We'll see lots of economists, we'll see political officials, and we'll see environmentalists. But the design community, I think, has to find a way to get to the table in whatever way you feel comfortable. How we design these cities, we really don't know how to redefine the relationship with water. How do we ensure that Great Lakes stays clean? And how we ensure, again, the baby in the beginning, these guys at the end, how do we ensure that this is clean for everybody coming along after us? So thank you. Thank you very much.